coming back to Maxi, who's coming back to Maxi J1820 and the Jet Set model. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Yes, okay. So first of all, I would like to thank the committee for organizing such a nice conference in such challenging times and also for giving me the opportunity to give this talk today. So I am Alessio Marino, I'm a postdoc fellow at the University of Palermo. And today I will tell you about the results of applying the jet set model uh, to that well, very famous <laughs> black hole binary Maxi J1820. Um, one so, moment, we don't see the slides online. Uh, uh, so maybe okay. the tech people can help us. We can see them now. Okay, go ahead with your talk, but just let okay, maybe know. Sorry, okay, oh, here we go, now we do. Okay, nice. Okay, so I think pretty much, you're pretty much convinced that X-ray binaries are accretion and dejection engines. As Natalie beautifully uh, overviewed this morning, we can see that we have both inflows and outflows of matter. Uh, inflows in the form of an accretion flow composed of a corona and an accretion disk, proper accretion disk, who emits mainly in the X-rays and outflows in the form also of a jet, which emits in the radio infrared uh, band. And um, as these systems evolve during an outburst, we can see them uh, displaying mainly two spectral states in the X-rays. Uh, these spectral states are an hard spectral state where the emission is dominated by the hot corona, and in this plot here is colored in blue, um, while uh, there's also another state, which is the soft state, where the emission is dominated by the disk, and in this plot is colored in red. There is also a third contribution, a third spectral component in X-ray spectra uh, of X-ray binaries, which is reflection, which is due to the reprocessing of the compensation spectrum from the corona uh, by the accretion disk. Uh, as debated uh, extensively yesterday, uh, and one interpretation behind the hard state is that in hard state, the disk is truncated uh, far away from the, black, from the black hole, while in the soft state, it reaches the ice core. But this is highly debated at the moment. Um, very interestingly, while in an outburst we move from hard to soft state, not only the accretion flow evolves, but also the jet properties. Indeed, we only observe jets in hard states, while in the soft state, at least for black holes, uh, jets are quenched, they seem to be disrupted. So this means that there is a an interconnection between accretion and ejection, despite them being quite different, I would say opposite phenomena. Um, many, many models, many paradigms have tried to um, address this interplay. Uh, one of them is the jet set model, which has been uh, um, presented yesterday by Samuel Bernier's talk. Uh, so I will just um, uh, summarize it very briefly for the people who didn't attend it yesterday. So basically, according, according to this model, imagine to have a, a vertical magnetic field um, in, a, in threading the equation disk. And imagine that this uh, magnetic field is concentrated close to the black hole. This creates a highly magnetized region and a lowly magnetized region. Um, the low magnetization region behaves like the, the standard circular solar IF disk, and I will call it standard accretion disk or SAD. While uh, in the highly magnetized region, the matter, the plasma is hot optically thin, uh, rarefied. So if you want, it behaves like your old friend, the hot corona. But also, since in this region there is this high impact of the magnetic field, particles are injected into the jet. So the jet acts like the platform for jet launch launching. And this is, I think, the very uh, interesting uh, part of this model. Uh, not only the jet set model allows us to uh, fit the X-ray spectra of X-ray binaries, but also since if we know that jet D, we can also describe the properties of the jet T. Um, it, 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 from uh, an, a nice saga of papers by uh, Marcel and also Samuel Barnier, uh, again, I will uh, invite you to see the, the, the talk from yesterday. They also were able to reproduce not only the X-ray, but also the radio spectral behavior of the of GX39-4. So this model is really an accretion and dejection model. Um, so we wanted to apply this model to another system, which is uh, MaxiJ1820. Uh, the system was discovered three years ago, was object of an unprecedented uh, multi-wavelength campaign. Uh, you can see it's, it's a gold mine for papers. I probably have, have cited only like a um, very small sample of them. Um, one of the most interesting, at least for this work, aspects of the system is the very is the controversy around the geometry of the accretion flow in the hard state. And again, this has been uh, debated yesterday. But as you, as you can see, 
uh, even analyze, analyzing the very same data, it's, uh, some authors have claimed that this reached the ice core in the uh, hard state, while the corona is a lamp post contracting during the hard intermediate state, or uh, the disk is truncated in the hard state, but it uh, moves, it migrates toward the uh, black hole during the intermediate state. Uh, also, um, there, there are some posters from Barbara Marco and Andrei Ziarski on this. I invite you to, uh, to take a look at them. Um, so, anyway, despite this controversy, one thing that all these authors agree on is that also the reflection spectrum is quite complex because uh, all these authors needed two reflection components to uh, properly describe uh, this, spe this spectrum. So, it's a very interesting system. In my project, I, uh, we analyzed the eight broadband data sets of the system. As you can see, they are all in the hard, hard intermediate state, uh, using data from XRT to, to NUSTAR to NICER and BAT. So at the end, we have um, controversy from uh, <laughs> uh, coverage from 0 0.8 to 200 kV. Um, and let's talk a little bit about the model. Uh, because it's an interesting model, because it's not like the typical model that we use for uh, describing X-ray spectra. It doesn't have the temperature of the corona or the temperature of the disk. The main parameters of this model are the mass accretion rate, um, uh, the inner mass accretion rate, and the radius, the transition radius between the jet and the sad. Um, other important parameters are the location of the ISCO, the sonic Mach number, which for non theoretician like, like me, uh, if you want, describes how fast the accretion flow proceeds at JAD phase. And finally, in this case, we include a reflection, which is based on the silver code. Um, so, again, since this system shows two reflection spectra, we tested two models one model with only one reflection and one model with two reflections. In any case, the innermost radius of reflection was tied together with the inner radius of the, with the transition radius between Jed and Sad, because we expect the disk, the, the Sad, to be the reflector. Um, and in the double reflection model, we uh, forced these two reflectors to be adjacent to each other and uh, left uh, the ionization free because we expect a gradient of ionization in the disk. So, Let's go to the results. According to this modeling, the evolution of the system can be, dis can be described, dis divided in three main phases. In the first phase, as you can see, we are in full hard state at the rise of the outburst. Um, the disk is located uh, quite far from the black hole. It's at 6 DRG. Uh, the inner mass accretion rate is high, but it's not yet at its full power. Um, the disk is mi and the disk is mildly ionized. In this case, we only need one reflection. Going on, there is a plateau phase in the hard, hard intermediate state uh, where we now need two reflections, as you can see from the, um, from the model used to, to fit the spectra. Um, the disk uh, is still truncated, or at least the, the optically thick disk is truncated, um, but it's a little bit closer to the black hole. The inner mass accretion rate at the peak of the outburst uh, reaches uh, even two times the, at the inner mass accretion rate. And um, now we see two reflections, and these two reflectors have different ionization. The, close, the inner one is highly ionized, while the outer one is mildly ionized. There is finally a third phase where there is a, a short episode of rehardening. We don't really know why. Um, as, you, as you can see, in this phase, there is still an approaching of the, uh, of the inner radius of the disk, and still two reflections. Uh, this time, the inner mass accretion rate is a little bit lower, and also the interesting the sonic Mach number seems to increase a little, which basically means that the jet left behind is a little is a little less dense because accretion flow proceeds faster at this phase. Interestingly, using these parameters, we can um, really track the evolution of the accretion flow in this system. As you can see um, from the mo from this model, we can uh, really see how the optical depth on top and the temperature of the, uh, the electron temperature change at the difference annually of the corona. So this is really a multi-zone contamination model. Alessio, three and minutes. Yes, thanks. And finally, very interestingly, again, we see two reflection spectra. The issue here is how can we explain it? Um, in Cara and et al. Um, et collaborator's paper, uh, the arising of this two reflection was explained uh, with uh, the top of the corona illuminating an outer region of the disk and the bottom of the corona illuminating an inner region of the disk. This argument cannot hold in our case because our geometry is pretty much different. 
Um, what we suggest is the possibility that uh, a jump in the disk profile might hide the contribution from uh, an inter intermediate regions of the disk, so, so this shadow zone over there. Uh, but what, uh, are, what originates this jump, we don't know, actually. It might be irradiation. Another possibility would actually be the same solution by CARA, but imagine to flip horizontally the, uh, the corona and put a black hole uh, inside of it. In, in that case, we would have that the, the um, jet on the other side of the black hole would illuminate the outer region of the disk, while the jet on this side of the black hole might illuminate the inner region of the disk. But these are just suggestions. Um, the takeaway message is that the JetSend model worked pretty well in uh, describing the, jet, the, the evolution of the accretion flow in Matthew J1820. Uh, we confirmed the uh, claim of other authors that uh, if you want, uh, the system uh, fits in the truncated uh, disk, a hot inner flow paradigm that was suggested for many other systems. And finally, we also confirmed the existence of two reflection components. The future, uh, as, as, as for GX39-4, all these results may or may not uh, be confirmed by the testing them to uh, predict, to reproduce the simultaneous radio emission. But this is something that will be done in the future. For the moment, I thank you for your attention and I, I very welcome questions by the audience. Thank you very much uh, for a great talk. And um, do we have any questions? I don't see any right now on Slack. Any on Zoom, so do we have any- There are questions room? in the room. Okay, sure. great, go ahead, please. Hi, this is Thomas Dauser. Um, have you looked into how strong the reflection is in your spectra because you have a strong assumptions on the geometry you're having and you kind of need uh, like a flux um, mm -hmm. estimate of how much reflection would you expect? Does this kind of fit together in your geometry? That's a very nice question, actually. Um, we, we looked into it. We don't have really a constraint from that. Uh, the first thing is that from the modeling, we cannot constrain the radius of this outer reflection. We fixed it to 300 RG, but it might be even higher than that. Uh, we are quite sure that it cannot, for example, consist with the region that launches optical winds because we don't expect that region so far away in the disk to really act like this uh, self-shielding thing. Uh, but if I don't really have a number for the location that we expect according to the flux, this is. Uh, yeah, but, but but from your model and the measurement, mm -hmm. you can just calculate how much reflected flux you have. I I just be interested in that number. No no no. I, I I mean I can I I don't have the numbers, but we can discuss uh, about it uh, for sure later because it's something that I would like to do. Okay, so we have a question on Slack from uh, Chiara Cecobello. Uh, Alessio, thank you for the nice talk. I was wondering, what is the vertical portion of the jet and what is reflected? Does it vary in between the different epochs? Um, sorry, can you, you can, cannot uh, really hear the question. Can you repeat it, please? Sure. Um, basically, she's asking, uh, what is the vertical extent of the jet? That, okay. you know, what exactly is being reflected and, and how does it vary between the epochs that you were discussing? Okay, uh, I, I cannot see. Can you see the the PowerPoint? Because I have the the the, the, read the slide too. Um, okay, at the yes. moment we we can't see the slides okay. online, but if you can. Ah, okay. Um, oh okay, wait, they're so, coming back. They're coming back. Okay, we see okay, the slides. Okay, so I guess this uh, really uh, ex explains it. So we, I mean, this is the disk profile, the jet profile in the in the different epochs. Uh, so as you can see, the, it is like more vertically extended in the first uh, in this first phase. It is in full hard state, while then it becomes uh, a little bit flatter. The point is that there might be also an atmosphere on top of this jet that might uh, increase the vertical extension of it. Probably uh, there there are people here in the room that can confirm uh, and uh, elaborate more on that. But yeah, we pretty much expect this to be the disk profile of the jet. Okay, thanks. Now, is there any other question within the room? Yeah, one question. Okay, let's go there, and then we have one online as well. So go ahead. Uh, here is Agata Ruzańska, and I, I would like to come back to your sketch mm -hmm. because you are showing that this inner disk is accreting faster, right? Mm -hmm. Like super Eddington. Uh, it's not super Eddington. Uh, the, it's true that the M dot over there is higher than Eddington, but we, we didn't take into account the efficiency. So you have to think like a 10% less of, the, of that uh, in mass accretion rate. So it's not super Eddington. Yes, but mm. uh, yes, because we have to stay in the thin disk mm -hmm. regime, right? Y yes. I because think. I see your 
inner yes, yes. disk mm -hmm. accreting faster is, mm -hmm. is thinner, but actually from models you have mm -hmm. opposite that super Eddington accretion makes your disk puffy. Uh, yes, probably this is, um, I would like, yeah, probably Gregor can answer that better. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Maybe we can move that to Slack because I had a related <laughs> question. I think that's a really nice one. And we have one final question uh, online from Mukesh Vyas. Go ahead. Hi, this is Mukesh from Bayern University. My question is uh, related to the basics of the uh, concept of reflection. Hey, can, you, can, you, can you repeat because the, the audio was very low. Can you repeat the question? Thanks. My question is related to the basics of the reflection concept. Mm -hmm. Why do we a priori assume that there will be reflection from the disk unless the um, frequency of the electromagnetic radiation is less than the plasma frequency? In other case, what I expect is the photons will enter inside the disk, will have multiple scattering and will be scattered with uh, the modified spectrum. So do we a priori assume that there will be a reflection of all the radiation that is infilling onto the disk? Um, um, I'm sorry, I, can you probably- Yeah, I mean, it's a very complicated question. And I think um, it might be a better one for Slack channel because he's discussing uh, plasma frequency. And okay. I think we could discuss some of yes, that. Sir. So why don't we say that, Mukesh, I'm sorry, it was also very difficult to hear you. So can you write it out in the Slack channel? Yes. Um, yeah. please. I missed many words, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, thank you. I will be very happy to reply online, but- and, um, and so I think at that point, we're, uh, let's see, were there any more questions in the room? If not, then I think we have finished. So thank you again, Alessio and everybody. And we are just on time for the break. Um, we have, we'll come back at uh, 1030, I guess. And one thing I just want to mention now is that the, uh, unfortunately, the speaker, Doris Mai, uh, canceled um, because she was sick. So um, I, I think, or he, I'm not sure actually. Um, but anyway, so that means we have a little bit more time. And what I would suggest is that we add that to the discussion because there was quite a lot of questions that we didn't get to and maybe we can get to some of those as well. So anyway, enjoy your break, everybody. And we'll see you back in a half hour. <laughs>